if we can get her to go. Good morning, Nick Goldschmidt here. Uh, this is the eighth of a series of webinars that we've been conducting on Friday mornings. And so this is the latest one. Uh, this one we are gonna be discussing, well, I call it strategies and tools for vineyard management, heat mitigation and maintaining quality in the vineyard. And hopefully that will reflect over into the wine as well. The uh, main focus will be on viticulture and it's a subject that is near and dear to me. In fact, I was asked to speak on this on this very um, subject at the Unified Grape and Wine Conference a, a couple of years ago. So uh, I've sort of upgraded it a little bit, thrown in some new slides because we've had new flooding and new fires and obviously a pandemic since then. So I thought I'd lead off with some recent USA headlines in newspapers and you know, basically the pace of emissions has been exceeding the early projections as demand for coal has continued to surge, although in recent months, this maybe has not occurred. And it's been matched by the rise in the use of oil and natural gas and driven basically by expanding populations and the, and the, the third world becoming more industrialized as well. More transportation, more industrial production, and more electricity use, just more, more, more. And so I think we're all completely aware of that. Science has continued to refine the basic picture of rising human influence of climate, particularly from the late 1950s. And in 1988, building on, a global, on global concerns about deforestation, acid rain, and, and damage to the ozone layer from, from certain synthetic chemicals has, uh, just has raised the discussion on whether or not global warming is, is an issue or not. For me, uh, I would call it global uncertainty or, or the weather patterns for me that I'm witnessing in the vineyards are certainly not as predictable as in the past. I thought this was a pretty funny photo uh, because now obviously it's become so bad that we all have to move to Mars. But, uh, and they recently discovered that there's ice on Mars and they found it at one of the poles. Well, I find that pretty interesting. I mean, they've spent millions of dollars trying to find water on Mars, and the first place I would have gone to was the uh, was the polar cap. So, I thought that was uh, that was pretty funny that uh, they that took until now to find that. So, I'm going to be talking about my personal, professional, and mainly anecdotal experience and how uh, vineyards are really affecting processing in wines, and hopefully, uh, what we're doing in the vineyard to mitigate some changes that have uh, have occurred in recent times and obviously i'm by no means an expert on global warming and it's not my area of expertise so i'm just going to be speaking from what i see from uh, from a winemaker's perspective and when i was asked to speak i thought well you know what do i know about this and and so i just started accumulating photos and uh, thought patterns to uh, to really what i'm seeing and it, and it is quite interesting that i have been witnessing some changes and we see it all around us every day. And when we look at it on a on a day by day basis, we probably don't see much change. But when we look at it over a long period of time, yes, we do. And I'll show you a slide a little bit later when we talk about harvesting and how the changes have occurred. So I'm going to start with basically a a a, a bunch of family photos. And this is a a trip that I did a a year ago uh, when we could travel to uh, Tahiti and. Uh, beautiful beaches and coral reefs and low-lying atolls and lots of beautiful mountains covered in trees. But the crisis is already occurring here in these sort of islands. And uh, they see rising tides, uh, a changing climate that's threatening to swallow up some of their land. And you can see even this island here is, uh, is um, uh, you know, this house here is, is getting very close to the water. And the Pacific Islands contribution to global warming patterns or global uncertainty patterns is pretty minimal, but they are the ones that are certainly feeling the effect. Uh, <clears throat> but like all small developing states, they suffer disproportionately the effects of, of global warming. The pearls are getting smaller, the sharks are becoming more rare, and islands are basically disappearing. And I was affected here because my coconut drinks were definitely smaller than I'm sure they were uh, when I was uh, in the Cook Islands about 30 years prior to this. Another way that I've been infect uh, affected is, uh, this is a picture of Tahoe, December 2017. 
and this is not a good site. My son is at university in, in Reno and he's reliant on snow because he's a snowmaker during the holiday season. And when the uh, temperatures are this warm, obviously there is no snow. So he's costing me money. So he had to go and find another job. In 2018, it also uh, affected me because his hours are totally subject to the temperature. So instead of starting when the field shuts down uh, at the end of the ski day, he actually goes back at 11 o'clock at night and works through to 11 in the morning. So completely different time frame. And so in 2019, when I was hoping to open my Christmas presents on uh, Easter, uh, on, <laughs> on Christmas morning, uh, we had to delay until 11 o'clock when he got back from work. So again, it affected me. And then we're from the north of New Zealand, and this is Mangafai. And typically we are in a subtropical region, so we get rainfall in the, in the summer, and we normally get it in the afternoon. So traditionally we would have Christmas dinner, big, heavy roast turkey, and then we'd shoot on down to the beach at three o'clock or so for a nice swim in the ocean on Christmas Day. Well, it's becoming fantastic because we don't get the rain anymore. So uh, we can actually really do this in a nice civilized manner. But as you can see, the beaches are still packed and people still don't go down there on Christmas day. But uh, anyway, certainly affected the, our swimming patterns after Christmas. Houses in the north where we're from uh, rely totally on, on rainfall and they collect rain from their roofs and they put it in these tanks and uh, you know, without water, you don't have laundry, you don't have water to drink, you don't have water to cook with, uh, et cetera. And this is becoming a, a devastating scene. They're not getting as much rain as they, as they used to. And so now they're having to truck water in. And uh, so this is really affecting normal life. I thought it was interesting. I just saw this headline yesterday that uh, the New Zealand, so New Zealand has a a carbon zero idea that we will by 2050 have a carbon neutral country. Well, the wine industry has agreed that they, they are going to uh, be ahead of that. So I'm not quite sure what that means. Obviously factors are a fuel, you know, going switching over to biofuels and uh, by in particular biodiesel, but also in the winery, we produce a hell of a lot of CO2, ethanol, water, and aromatics. And so they get given off during fermentation so how do we, we we have the technology to capture it but what do we do with it what do we do with all that ethanol that we're producing that is currently going into the atmosphere so uh, this will be interesting times 2017 was certainly the year from you can fill in the blank although 2020 is not much fun either but 2017 we had the the tubs fire was the biggest fire until the following year when we had the campfire and then we had the Kincaid fire in 2019, which is the one that we've just experienced. So from the Tubbs fire, we had 36,000 acres burned in one month. We had 22 people, unfortunately, lost their lives. And uh, that day, or the next morning, sorry, I flew out. The winds were incredibly impressive. But one thing I did notice is we never had our power cut during that time. Very interesting, considering what happened to the next one. And of course, this is the devastating scene, or this is the the memory shot of what the fire did in 2017 to the Hilton, which sits just above Santa Rosa. And there's a, there's another, ho there was another hotel just below this, of course, that also uh, disappeared. So I flew out, as I said that morning, and this is a photo looking down over the Napa Valley, how devastating that uh, the Tubbs fire was. And when I returned three days later, this is what it looked like. This is about uh, 11 o'clock in the morning standing in one of our vineyards that uh, is just amazing to see the sun like that. Uh, it looked like a, basically it looked like a bomb had dropped. And then 2019, you know, the Tubbs fire was 38,000 acres. Look at the size of the Kincaid fire, 77,000 acres. I mean, massive, but mainly from the north this time, Napa did not get hit that much. <clears throat> it was mainly in Sonoma. And again, I was flying out and this is a photo uh, flying out that day, looking actually over Sonoma County, I was heading north again. And two things that occurred, I remember Hillary waking me up, uh, well, before on, a, on my way to bed that night, she's my youngest daughter, and we looked out the window and we could see this yellow glow way to the north of us. And I'm like, you know, that's crazy, um, thinking that that might be a fire. And then by the next morning, they were evacuating Geyserville 
and Guysville was certainly in the middle of the of the fire, or they thought it would be in the middle of the fire. Luckily, no buildings were damaged, but it was uh, it was evacuation for everyone. We still had about three vineyards left to harvest at that point, and I'll talk about what the influence of that meant. The next day, Healdsburg was evacuated, and I remember that being a Friday night because I was flying out on the Saturday, sorry, Saturday night because I was flying out on the Sunday morning. And so we went and stayed with friends in Santa Rosa. And two days later, even Santa Rosa was evacuated. But I do also remember that the power was cut off about three days prior. So they were, PG&E was very aggressive in making sure there was no electricity flowing at that time. There's a photo of uh, obviously myself, Hillary, and Royce, we were the, the three still living at home. And this is a map showing, this is the end or the worst day, if you like, of the evacuation. You can see it was evacuated all the way to the coast. Healdsburg itself was right in here. Geyserville was up in what the red area, if you like. And Santa Rosa, half of Santa Rosa was included in this. So quite a, uh, a big area that was evacuated. This is a photo of the fire from one of the wineries where we work at. And uh, it was, yeah, it was a lot of smoke. And then driving around during the Kincaid fire, when I got back uh, three days later, we certainly had our masks on again. And since we've become experts at wearing masks. And, but it, it was an interesting fire to watch because it was sort of, you know, little bits. It wasn't continuous at this point. And, uh, but there was hundreds and hundreds of these little spot fires at the, the firemen had to deal with and there were roadblocks everywhere and to get to our vineyards uh was uh or even to the one of the wineries we were behind uh we were behind closed off roads and so this is a photo of myself trying to get to one of our wineries if we look at the floods which was the next uh <laughs> opportunity that we had healsburg 2017 this is our little coffee shop morning breakfast place that we go to uh, uh you know two three times a week and here we are kayaking right down past the right <laughs> crazy and this is Guerneville and Guerneville in 2019 this is Safeway so obviously we can determine what place is at the top of the hill and so Safeway obviously uh, was at the top of the hill and all the houses around it were um, badly damaged Guerneville uh, often gets hit and going back to 2017 this is our house you can see this is the swimming pool and that's the vacuum for the swimming pool. And this next photo shows not only the children out and about over the swimming pool in a, in a little uh, rowboat, um, but you can see the water just starting to come in through the window. Uh, that's the water level and into my wine cellar. So sometimes you'll see me take photos or videos with muddy bottles, and that's because of the flood that we had in 2017. So how's it affected my vineyard and wine life? Well, I, I didn't think much of it at the time, but it has actually, when I start looking back over time. You've seen me draw this uh, chart before, this, this time from flowering to harvest. And at this point we get Veraison, this is acidity. Uh, peaks is the berries change color as we go through Veraison. This is when we start to get an increase in sugar. The flavor starts off relatively low and then tannins move from green to dusty to dry to ripe. And in Bordeaux, this is 100 days. The, we have these beautiful ripening conditions. You know, we used to have 125 days, but now, you know, we're hitting 140, 145 days from bloom to harvest if we really wanted to push it that far. So we've certainly seen more, well, longer, longer warm spells would be a quick way to wrap it up. And I thought that this slide was pretty interesting. Since arriving in the USA for the 89 vintage, six of those vintages, of those vintages, six, uh, I have not picked in November. And of them in the last six years, uh, as I said, so five of them in the last six years. So yeah, we're not picking in November. These last two, 2020, uh, sorry, 2019 and 2018, we did pick into November, just into November. But look, we've been picking in October. So our last day of harvest has been moving earlier and earlier. And we've even had some pick days in August uh, to start the harvest, which is also very rare. So yes, we've certainly seen 
a change in the, 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 the end of harvest. And I think that that's quite dramatic. So we're still getting the long hang time is what I'm trying to say, but the flowering is starting earlier relatively and, and, and the harvest is moving up a little bit. So the, uh, it's, it's, it's a big change. And the other change that I've noticed, and I don't have it on here, is that our highs are not, we don't have a week of highs. I mean, sometimes we do, but when we have a heat spike, man, we have a, it's a big spike. You know, we'll hit 110 or 117. Uh, I'm not talking about sitting in the 90s. I remember we used to sit in the 90s a lot. But what has changed is our nighttime temperatures. Our nighttime temperatures are not as cold as what they once were. And so we don't have that period of warming in the morning. We don't have to have a lot of sun warming the environment up in the morning. We actually get off to a nice clean start. And that's probably what's allowing our end of season dates to be moved forward. So one of the biggest influences that I've seen is uh, some of the sprays that we've been using to slow down harvest. And that's really the big deal. And some of these clays or starlight oils have, they're like you putting makeup, if you like, on, on, a, on a grape cluster and trying to, uh, you know, protect it from sunburn. Uh, changing style to a lower alcohol is, is another way to do it. But I'm, a, I'm in agreement with the lower alcohol, but I'm not in agreement of just picking early. If you want to pick early, then you have to change the vineyard to make sure that the flavor and tannin is right. So delaying pruning is one option, which we'll talk about. Leafing a little bit differently, uh, crop thinning later and later, but that has its own issues as well. Uh, mechanical thinning provides a couple of options. Firstly, loading up the crop you can delay phenological advancement. And then it has been shown to stop cell division for seven to 10 days as well. So loading up the crop and then uh, doing our crop drop a little bit later is, is what I'm trying to say. It gives us smaller berries as well and more open, more open clusters. A lot of research has been showing no difference in harvest dates, but these are really compared to controlled env environments or control vineyards, which generally are overcropped anyway. And so uh, they have a delayed maturity. So a lot of those studies even though they're saying it doesn't make a difference, I see that it does make a difference. So counter to what we've been reading. And then going back to leafing, I think uh, mechanical leafing rather than mechanical thinning this time, but mechanical leafing is, uh, accentuates the methoxypyrazines or the green flavors as well, because mechanically thinning is one thing, but mechanically leafing has to be a lot more accurate in terms of timing, because if you remove those young leaves that are creating all the photosynthetic area, you're actually slowing down the maturity because those young leaves are the most active. The old leaves at the top of the canopy are, are not as active anymore. And so that delays maturity and, and it can delay it too much. And so we end up with a situation where we get too many green characters and we don't get the correct ripening, if that makes sense, sorry. Vegetative growth, especially post veraison will also delay flavor development, and that's where it comes. That's where tipping comes in, and giving long that will help give longer hang time. And so the timing and the height of that tipping is really important. Uh, also, uh, more irrigation management is important as well. So changing variety is not, you know. It's not really an option, but that is, is one option. In fact, I've been reading incidences where they've been approving other varietals into Bordeaux. Um, but uh, I really like the idea of pruning. I think pruning has a lot of influence over what we need to be doing. I think uh, pruning later is important because we get the sap to flow. And when the sap's flowing, it's very hard for us to spread fungal diseases from vine to vine. When, this, when the sap is not flowing, uh, when we prune, we, um, we can easily spread some of the fungal diseases. The other thing too is when you cane prune, and if you look at this vine here, this is all the power this vine has. Then we have these three canes that we lay down and, and uh, you can imagine the shoots come from these buds nice, uh, nice and evenly, and they get off to a late start because there is not much stored carbohydrate in a small vine like this. In a minute, you're gonna see a, a cane prune, I'm sorry, a spur prune vineyard, where you have the arms going out here and there's a lot more power 
in, in those vineyards themselves. The other piece is when a shoot grows, it has two clusters on it. What you can do is if you remove the, the lower cluster is always riper than the, than the higher cluster. So one thing you could do is remove the lower cluster and that would delay ripening as well. Uh, but again, is that a really good idea because the tannins and flavor development in that lower cluster are probably a little bit more interesting than the upper cluster. Another option is growing taller vines, which we'll look at in a second. So here's a, here's a photo of a, an old spur prune vineyard. Two things to notice here. These are the, the spurs, so you get two buds uh, on the end of these, and then we get the canes, and we get a lot of congestion. And we get an earlier bud push because you have so much more power. This is the horizontal, the, the, the vine is right here. You have so much more power in this. So the, the vine will spring into action and spring a lot sooner than it would on a cane prune situation. The second thing you'll notice is we get these large cuts. And these large cuts are what cause you type, and we'll talk about that a little bit later as well. So you think these look like ordinary vines, but inside this jungle there is a hidden trap. And this is what growers do. They will put a extra long shoot here that they call a kicker cane. So this is wood from last year, but they've trained it vertically up. And so you get an extra four to five shoots. This one's a four cane shoot. They've left extra four or five shoots here. And so they can increase the amount of crop and I do not like this at all because this is a spur prune vineyard, but they obviously don't think they've got enough yield, so they throw in this kicker cane to increase the yield. Not a good way to do it. And if you were a better pruner than this, you wouldn't need to do it because what you could do is use this as a spur position for next year and put two buds on there and two buds on here if you so choose but not to do this thing which is called a kicker cane and these canes are just another way to be a lazy spur pruner in terms of increasing bud count not good yeah i don't like that technique at all I, I, as i said i just think it's a lazy way to increase bud count cause more congestion and and remember when you have a kicker cane that's vertical those shoots are all going straight up and they're causing a heck of a lot of compaction there. Whereas when, you, when you're in a horizontal situation, you get far more uh, diversity across. Uh, growing a taller vine, as I said, is an interesting option because the, the, uh, it takes a, a longer time to get from the, the moisture from here to here as we head into spring. Uh, you'll notice that in some of the older vineyards in the Rioja and, and in parts of Bordeaux, of course, they grow the vines lower to the ground because they want to make the, the season come on earlier. In Spain, because they don't have a lot of water, so they run out of water. And in Bordeaux, they want to pick a little bit earlier because they have inclement weather. Another option is not to do any leaf removal at all. And so you'll end up with some yellowing, some senescing. You'll also notice in this vineyard and actually in this vineyard that you have complete grass cover as well. So this is allowing, this is in a cooler region. And this allows at the end of the season when we have rainfall that this rain is quickly absorbed into the ground and it still allows us to get our tractors and people down the rows to do the harvest so that's an important consideration especially true in new zealand canada and southern parts of chile so also worth consideration this is what i was talking about earlier about this is a little bit complicated but this is what i was talking about as far as um crop removal and this these clusters are taken at Verazon. These are the, the upper clusters, the this, this second cluster on the shoot. So the lower cluster on the shoot would be 100% colored, and the second cluster on the shoot could look like this. So the question is, firstly, which cluster do we remove? Obviously, I prefer the lower one. The upper one is not as interesting. The second thing is, if you say, all right, I'm going to leave these clusters on until later, the problem is that for somebody coming through and doing thinner later on, thinning later on, these clusters will all be colored up. And we know that when we taste them, even though they're, they're dark or black, that they taste different, but visually they're not that different. So it's hard to make a decision about which clusters to remove if you wait until too far past, uh, past um, Verizon. So, you know, that's, that's a really important consideration. Another thing that we're looking at, of course, is increasing the vigor of the rootstock, or we're trying to find rootstocks that have deeper roots, because as we run into less and less water through time, 
the vines that we, we have have to be much more sustainable. So if we can irrigate less, which we'll end up having to do anyway, and heading more and more to dry farming, because you know the vineyard life expectancy, commercial vineyard life expectancy is 30 years. I'm sure that over a period of 30 years, we're gonna have a, a significant dry spell. In fact, you know that's what we witnessed between, well, 2012, which was the 10 out of 10 vintage, but from 2012, till now basically we've had uh, dry seasons even though we had those floods in 17 and 19 that was just a heck of a lot of rain in a very short period of time but basically we've been having drier winters in, in typical maybe i could argue, you, you can argue 2019 i'll give up there uh so how do we prevent sunburning this is uh with all these canopy changes etc that we we're experiencing well the key thing for me is the row orientation i'll show a a, a little slide here in a minute of, of choosing the correct row orientation. Avoid west facing slopes because they're the afternoon slopes. East facing slopes are more interesting because we get morning sun. Afternoon sun is, is on the west face, so that's much hotter. Uh, we want to avoid exposure, so we don't really want to be on the tops of the hills where the soil is thinner, so the, the vineyard is getting less water, so hard to maintain the canopy. Providing shade cloth, there's lots of different versions of shade cloth. We'll look at that in a minute. And then uh, perhaps choosing a later ripening rootstock, as I said, so something that's more drought tolerant. But certainly we don't want to have clusters look like this that we see here. So you can see if we're in the uh, northern hemisphere, the, uh, we want to plant just off uh, north-south. So you can imagine the... Uh, the sun goes from the east to the west, okay? So if you have a vineyard planted east-west, and we're in the northern hemisphere, the sun is sitting here and it's shining directly on the, um, sorry, the sun is going, if we plant the rose north-south, the sun would be, would be shining directly on this side of the vine. And so uh, that's, uh, that's gonna completely burn one side, whereas the other side of the vine is, is not gonna be bothered. Sorry, this is for the Southern Hemisphere. In the Northern Hemisphere, we wanna plant this because the sun is coming in this direction. And so the idea is that at three o'clock in the afternoon on August 15, I wanna have the sun directly overhead and I'll show you a photo of that in a second. But with we're getting more and more radiation and so uh, the light is becoming much stronger. In some of those areas, we would have holes in the ozone layer would be like New Zealand, and so is there a question that Marlborough in New Zealand is gonna lose its advantage uh, for, uh, for Sauvignon Blanc because the radiation is becoming stronger. This is a vineyard, this is a crime. Look at the canopy, there is no canopy here at all. This is a Napa Valley Chardonnay, and the guy, the uh, vineyard uh, person invited me out to come and have a look to see what I could do about it. And I said, well, you know, we should have picked it a month ago for champagne because it's, this is not going to make quality Chardonnay, but this is Napa Valley, man, and it's expensive fruit, but, and it all got made. Anyway, so, uh, yes, Chardonnay in the Napa Valley is being affected as well, and, I, and I've always thought that Chardonnay is, a, maybe you can get away with some of it in Carneros and some of the, the deeper non-clay soils, but certainly a little bit too warm for my style of Sauvignon Blanc. The other thing that's changed with the climate is we've seen more insect problems moving from the south. So there was a problem that we had a couple of years ago with the glassy wing sharpshooter, if you recall, and we were all in a mad panic about it. This is a blue green sharpshooter. Now this guy we've always had to put up with. It lives in the riparian area. And for those that have been to my house in Dry Creek, we live on a river and you know that we have periwinkle and native grape and that's where the blue green sharpshooter loves to live. And if you look at my vineyard out there, you'll see a lot of traps. So we have traps out there for glassy wing sharpshooters, which we've never seen, obviously. Blue green sharpshooters that we do see. And now we have new traps out there for the apple moth, which is um, definitely another pest that we'll probably have to deal with in the future. We've got it under control at the moment. Eutypha, which I'll mention a little bit again in a second. Red blotch, which you may have heard of, which has been hitting Cabernet. We don't know what it is at this point. There's a lot of conjecture, but basically the vine stopped ripening at about 18 bricks. And then esca, which is a blockage of the phloem and xylem. The vine goes under stress, uh, usually from lack of, well, triggered by a lack of water. And phomopsis is another one. So when you cut the cane, you'll see the pith is black rather than woody. And when you've got that situation, that could be esca or, or black goo, as some people call it, or phomopsis, could be any of those. 
and then the viruses themselves are spreading more easily. And uh, that's why, as I said, I, I prefer to prune uh, when the sap is running. I love this photo. This is a vine that I cut in half for a grower. This, this vine obviously has got Utypa, and you can see that the flow and the xylem have been completely blocked off. This vine is completely dead here, and it's actually started to kill uh, down the sides of this, of this piece of the vine as well, and it's starting to show up here. This is, uh, this is the, the dead wood in the middle, so not, not that big a deal. And you can see it here. So the way to solve Utypa in the past has been to take a shoot from down here, because this is the graft union, this is the rootstock, this is the scion, this is the graft union. So you take a shoot from down here and train it up, and hopefully you beat the Utypa that's spreading quickly uh, down the vine. That is one option. But if you wait too long, like in this vine, because we've already got some of, it, some of the blockage showing up, that uh, you're gonna have to remove the vine. I thought this vineyard, this photo was really cool. I found this in an old, <laughs> an old textbook as usual that I happen to be reading recently that this is uh, an old way to head prune. So we talk about cane pruning, but this is, this is the way a lot of California was pruned. It was head pruned. And each time they would take the cane, uh, so this was four years ago, three years ago, two years ago, last year. So this is, you got your two bud spur and your two bud spur. And we were basically growing small vines. We didn't have irrigation back in those days. So these vines were relatively small and we planted them a little bit closer uh, than what we currently have. But uh, in, a, in general, this is sort of the direction that we're taking today with cane pruning. We're planting closer, we're making the vines smaller and that's gonna allow us to make better quality without sucking too much water and nutrients out of the ground as well. So I thought it was a really interesting uh, picture that I found in this textbook. So looking at the pruning, this is the way we used to prune and this is the way we should prune. And this is true for you home gardeners as well. When you go prune your peach trees or uh, um, fruit, whatever fruit trees that you want to prune, you do, or even your um, whatever tree that you're trying to trim back, you do not want to cut next to the main trunk of the tree. You want to cut here because uh, what happens is when you cut, the, 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 the plant dies backwards. So if you cut here, it dies backwards into the trunk. And so hence we want to cut here, you come back the following year and cut here because by now it's dead. So you want to be cutting dead wood, not live wood. Hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully uh, you do that in your home garden as well. This is what happens when you do cut too close, you do have to paint it. But even then I'm very skeptical. I'm not sure if that works. And uh, so I like this because the, the cane was cut here and next year it'll die back to here and then next year we can cut here. So uh, just, it may look ugly, but it's actually gonna keep the plant alive for a lot longer than, than we would otherwise think. Now I talked about mechanical uh, cluster removal and mechanical leaf removal. Mechanical cluster removal is still, has not been perfected, but uh, this is a, these are leaf blowers. So you can, you can blow leaves or suck leaves depending on uh, which type of machine that you've got. But I just thought I'd mention this uh, really quickly because uh, you, can, you can adjust leaf removal uh, quite easily. So here's a situation that was done by hand on the left, and here's a situation that was done by machine on the right. So when you tell people to remove leaves, this could end up being the result. When you tell a machine to remove leaves, you can dial it in, a, you know, almost you could dial in a little bit better. So, you know, you can you can be as effective or or less effective, uh, whatever way you want. So uh, I'm I'm not a, I'm not opposed to using uh, leaf deleafing machinery. I think uh, mechanical uh, crop removal, though, I'm a little bit more skeptical about. So this is the correct row orientation. August 15, 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The shadow is completely overhead. There is no excessive sunburn. This is it. One hour later, actually, it's a vineyard. These vineyards are about 20 minutes apart, believe it or not. You can see that this vineyard is completely wrong. This is four o'clock in the afternoon or 3.30 3 in the afternoon. You can see that this side faces to the no uh, south because we're in the Northern Hemisphere and it's been completely burnt. And so we remove leaves above the crop to hopefully get 
the sunlight onto the clusters on the on this on the north side of the vine we end up picking the fruit separately the north and the south side not an ideal situation so if you remember back to those compass shots that i showed earlier you want to be off north south by about 15 to 20 degrees depending on your latitude to make sure that you get this situation where you have uh, a nice even shadow in the hottest part of pre-harvest and i always say august is the hottest month that affects grapes so uh, that's my that's my goal personal goal and as i said going back to uh head pruning and this uh, example on the left here is in argentina in the Uco Valley and what we're doing is we're growing very small vines because we have very we have a lack of water because in Mendoza of course we rely on snowfall I'm going to show you a photo right at the end of this presentation that will show you the dramatic effect of lack of snowfall in the Andes has, is having in, in Mendoza so the problem with these small vines though is that uh, you get very short shoots you only get about four or five leaves per shoot which means you've got to crop it extremely low to, to make sure the maturity is going to get there. And I'm not really, I get it. We've made good wines from these vines, but I prefer this situation where we try to get a little bit more canopy growth. Uh, the problem is if we didn't train it up, it all flops over all over the place and we go back to this unmanageable situation, these vines unmanageable. So we train it up and when we train it up, we put rope or string or, some sort of tie around here and then what happens is we get too much exposure onto the cluster so we've got now we've got the canopy right we've got enough leaves but now we've got too much sunburn so this chap came up with another idea and i and i think i've shown you this slide before this is a Syrah vineyard where they've now tied these canes together and so they've formed this tunnel or the shading so now we've got the the canopy but now we've also got the shading and for those who watched one of my earlier presentations on the staircase vineyard that we're planting in in northern uh, Alexander Valley? I'm planting Malbec like this, so please come out and visit, and we'll be we'll be tying these things up in a couple of years. It's still a young vineyard at this stage, but I'm pretty excited about it. Now this is a situation again growing smaller vines, but this is the wrong way to do it. This is a situation where they've brought that vine up so quickly. This vine is only two years old. Look how skinny that trunk is, and look at the crop they've thrown on it. No wonder the leaves are senescing and falling apart. This vineyard, this vine is in total collapse, and yet the uh, the grower is driven to do this because he wants to make a return on his on his property as quickly as he can. In wet climates or soils with higher water holding capacity, we often find that small vines become excessively vigorous, uh, like this situation, and. Uh, close spacing of around about one meter which is about three feet can be quite problematic it's expensive to manage and the benefit to quality is quite dubious so we don't really talk about tons per acre anymore we talk about plants per hectare plants per acre and then pounds per vine or yeah that's probably a better way to do it we're talking about four or five pounds per plant uh grown and on about a one meter situation, but I think one meter is too too close. So we're looking at about 1.2 meter, which is uh, for you Americans is about well, let's say uh, five, well four and a half feet. Uh, but most vineyards today are being planted six feet between vines and seven feet between rows. Uh, if I can get to five feet between vines and seven feet between rows, that's that's even better. But um, basically, six by seven or five by seven is really what we're looking at. In arid environments, we're able to plant closer now because uh, we have the availability of irrigation, which we didn't have irrigation before. And this has caused dramatic changes for us. So for me in Cabernet, eight ton per hectare or four tons per acre, uh, you know, it's about 7,000 vines per hectare. But uh, if we do that, we can get up to 24 tons per hectare. And yet we, all we're doing is we're increasing the pounds per vine. We're not, a, a, and planting closer. So we can't really say, oh, you know, this vineyard is four ton an acre, therefore it's producing better quality than this one. It's a 12 ton an acre because we're talking about apples and oranges. We've got more plants, we've got smaller vines, and uh, so they can, they can ripen a crop more easily. So I think the jury is still out on how we want to discuss this, but um, at the staircase vineyard, because it's on a slope, we're going to be planting a little bit further apart. We're going to be planting at about seven and a half feet eight feet between rows and i'm still going to go to uh 
five and a half feet between vines if I can. So that's my plan anyway. So that leads us to canopy management. The, the vineyard on the right is a beautiful vineyard. This is perfect for me, except the trunk's not quite straight, but nice, straight, VSP, cane pruned. You can see there's no old wood out here. So this for me is, is a beautiful vineyard. It's in a sandy soil. Uh, so even though you see tractor ties, that does not mean it's compaction. But when it's, you know, when it's done correctly, that's how even it is. Okay, now this is, these are vineyards that are not done correctly. Ways in which these people think they're using VSP. This vine is not vertical at all, it's horizontal. This vine was never trained straight in the first place. Uh, this is why I don't like using bamboo. This one here is bamboo as well. But bamboo, you've got to make sure that it's straight. And then moving foliage wise, are, uh, this, they're unclear on the concept because this wire, this moving foliage wire has been uh, stapled to the post. That's not very movable. This vine is completely hilarious. So what happened here, this, wow. Okay, that tie there should not be there. They're strangling the vine as well. So again, another problem. But basically what they did was they brought the vine up here after two years and they trained it out here as a unilateral because they wanted to get a crop really quickly. And then instead of coming back and reforming the head by, by pruning here and then training out two canes, they just brought a cane from the unilateral back here. This is a complete and utter disaster. This vineyard is going to last 30 years and they completely screwed it up in the first two. This is not the way to be forming vines and quite clear on the con unclear on the concept about how to form a head. You want to form it about 20 centimeters below the fruiting wire. You got one cane coming this way and one cane coming that way, even whether or not you use spur pruning or cane pruning, same, same objective, but do not train unilateral and then train it back. This is, this is completely nuts. There's another way to improve shading to delay ripening, and that's uh, not to do it this way. <laughs> so these are weeds. Uh, I've shown this photo before, quite a famous winemaker. Uh, I don't think weeds are a good idea to form shading in canopy. Uh, I showed this, uh, this other slide here one other time. This is our vineyard. This is the Dutton Ranch in Green Valley. So this is the coldest place in the Russian River where we grow grapes. And it's so cold, we've got moss growing on the arm of the vine. But for those who've tried the Dutton Chardonnay, the Singing Tree Reserve Chardonnay, and for those who haven't, and by the way, today is International Chardonnay Day, please make sure you get to try a bottle. So yeah, try the Singing Tree, but if you get a hold of the bottle of the, of the Dutton, um, it's awesome, awesome wine. So uh, if you want to get a hold of a bottle, please let me know. But you can see the moss here, I think it's completely crazy that, yeah, we definitely got delayed ripening here and so delayed that we pick about 80% of our Cabernet before we come here and pick uh, the Dutton Chardonnay. So that's how cold this, this area is. Now this photo, this slide is taking a long time for me to put together. So you've seen this bottom one here. This is your perfect BSP with your nice little clip keeping the wires together. These are the moving foliage wires. We clip and we clip, keep everything nice and vertical. There are two other, there are other ways to do vertical. If you want to get more crop, other than leaving those kicker canes, et cetera, what you can do, this is what we call a Tikawata 2T, a TK2T, Tikawata 2T system. This is a vine here and a vine here. This vine here is grown here, and this vine here is grown up here. So two completely different vines, but grown at different, um, different heights. <coughs> Excuse me. The problem here, is that the lower canopy gradually gets shaded out and eventually dies. And when I came to see me in 1990, we had a Tikawata two tier system just like this. This is not that one. It took me a long time to find another photo actually, but the, uh, the lower tier gradually dies out because there's no sunlight getting onto those buds. So not only do they become less fruitful, but they also become less vigorous. And so they get shorter and shorter and eventually die out. There are other versions like um, Scott Dyson, Smart Henry, uh, Smart Dyson, they're all other ways to do this. This is a Smart Dyson system. So you can see on this one here that the canes are gonna be trained down and these canes are gonna be trained up. I think it's completely unnatural. It takes a lot of extra work to train these canes down and, and, and all you end up with, in fact, I have photos, actually I should show you, I have a, devastating photo of a vineyard in the Alexander Valley of this. 
what you end up with is an amazing wall of fruit, just solid, solid wall of fruit, completely overexposed, and just so many tons per acre is just ridiculous. So I'm not a big fan of vertical splits, but I can live with a horizontal split. So this is a this is a design by Alain Carboneau, who's a Frenchman. This is a U system. There's also the V system, which is tighter. The U system, though, you clean the insides out, and basically you have two vertical um, platforms for fruit. Uh, so you're taking this original system and throwing up two of them. And so a good way that if you've planted this vineyard and you've got an oopsie moment and that you've decided that you need more vigor, or you've got too much vigor for the, uh, for the canopy, you can do this. Um, so you can actually increase your bud count this way. Which leads me to increasing shade to slow ripening. So the key is to make sure winemakers are comfortable for God forbid if they ever get out of their cars. And I love this photo of my friend Sebastian standing under a 120 year old petite Syrah vineyard. It's furrow irrigated grown on an arbor system, but he'll get out of the car to look at this because uh, he can stand in the shade. Uh, cool guy, very good winemaker. And uh, despite the, uh, the ugliness of the vineyard, the quality of a vineyard like this, because it's so old. And this is where I think old vines really make an impact. We talk about old vines Zinfandel, and I've talked about old vine Chardonnay, which I talked about with uh, Singing Tree itself. And obviously the Dutton is also an old vine Chardonnay, but you know, old vine Cabernet is, is also important. Now growing vines horizontally is this one is a little bit out of control and it's not until the winemakers get out of the car and they walk down the row and they see these vines that have fallen over. This is taking horizontal shoot positioning to a whole new level. Uh, this is not what we want. This is a situation in the middle here uh, where we have uh, again too much exposure of the of these clusters down low and so we have to remove leaves up high and hopefully we're going to get um, light onto the not only onto the cluster on the other side but we're also going to get light onto the to the row next door because these canopies are too high and they're casting a shade over onto the canopy you can start to see some of the shadow here on this row as well if i'd come here a little bit later you would see that the vines would be in complete shadow Okay, this guy was really interesting. We, he came to one of my little seminars on, uh, on canopy management and uh, he took it to heart. I think this guy was from NASA or something. So he threw up all this wire and metal and, and came up with this amazing system where he can move the wires in and out based on how he thinks the shade and the time of the year is going. Incredible, smart as. The problem is there's a heck of a lot of, of handwork here. And so, uh, um, interesting and the quality is the quality of the of this vineyard is really good but just too much work and and uh probably too expensive to run so uh netting so we have lots of different forms i'm going to show you bird netting a little bit later on but uh we have bird netting and hail netting and then these guys got crazy and they thought they'd use white um shade cloth this this vineyard is in in uh a neighboring vineyard to one of the vineyards I work on in, in Canada. And what they tried to do with the white cloth is to bring more light into the fruit zone here, which is a complete disaster because the canopy is, I'm not even gonna go there, it's just a complete mess. Um, so the weather has gone crazy as we know, and it's, and it's uh, as I said, I think it's more like global uncertainty. Now a cloud like this is a concern. There's two sorts of clouds I don't like. I don't like this one. And I don't like the ones that are really vertical. The ones that are vertical clouds, they're the ones that are super windy. And when we're ever in Argentina and I'm flying back to uh, Santiago that day, I always know it's going to be extremely bumpy flight uh, or vice versa. But this cloud uh, really makes everybody worried. And uh, this is what came from that cloud. And you can see, I've never seen hailstones like this. Phenomenal granizo. Uh, same size as this, these tomatoes, tomatoes, which are right here. But... This is in Rancagua, which is actually in Chile. So it's even more rare. Now, if that has happened in Argentina, when I would have gone, okay, I get it, freak storm. But we get hail there quite a lot, perhaps not at this size, but certainly not in Rancagua in Chile. This is completely crazy. And look what it did to the vineyard. <clears throat> this vineyard was in perfect condition about uh, a month away from harvest and the, the vineyard is completely destroyed. 
impressive what Hale can do in about uh, less than a minute. Just amazing. So this is uh, Hale netting. This I'm very honoured to know this guy. His name is Martin Kaiser. He just got nominated, uh, sorry, named the top viticulturalist in the world. And I get to work with him on a project in Argentina. Fantastic guy. And I'm hoping maybe one day we can get him on one of these uh, webinars and he could be my partner. We could, we could talk vineyards all day and bore the heck out of you. So this is hail netting. And so what we did was instead of having the netting going uh, vertical here against the canopy, we tie it in the middle. And that's what Marcos is doing here is tying the, uh, these two um, nets together. And then to get under it, because you saw that in, in um, this photo, it's very hard to work the canopy when you have a situation that's like this and it's tucked. So they'll leave it tucked like that until they've got vineyard work to do. And then they, they unclip it and they clip it in the middle. And you uh, can then drive a tractor underneath because it can scoop up underneath the, uh, underneath the netting. Other issues that we've seen, and I've talked briefly about this before, is with the lack of water become, become more pests. So the first uh, animal that has a, suffers from a lack of water, of course, is a bears. And this is in the Okanagan. We put all these posts in here and they use these posts as like springboards or trampolines, if you like. They just bounce against them until they break and then they just wander on through and they, they can strip a vine in a couple of minutes. No problem at all. And who's going to scare? Who's going to scare a, uh, a bear out of the vineyard? Birds are a big deal. And this is in New Zealand where we use bird netting because uh, and for those who have seen Forefathers Sauvignon Blanc, the name of the vineyard is called Waxi. And those Waxi's eat nothing but grapes. And so hence that, that, that wine that we make called Forefathers Sauvignon Blanc Waxi is named after the birds that eat all the grapes. And they feed for basically uh, 20 miles. And you notice this is a rare photo because they're actually trees. So there's not many trees in Marlborough and so the birds don't have anywhere to roost, but they can feed for 20 miles. They'll fly to uh, feast on a vineyard. <clears throat> but the worst by far, the worst damage that I've seen by far is rabbits. I um, mean, I don't even know really, really where to start because um, this is Ricardo who's a well-known viticulturist, but what we've done is uh, we've buried the, the rabbit fence about a foot below ground here and uh, that's preventing the rabbits from getting into the vineyard but this is uh, the other option is to put the netting or the wire around the trunks of the vine but the rabbits are not that stupid they can actually get under under this netting and still girdle the vineyard uh, i hope it doesn't happen to us in california because if it did man it, it's this is serious business and the main issue is if you can and you can see it in this vineyard here there's there's absolutely no brush, no green grass at all on these hillsides anymore. So the rabbits come straight into the, to the vineyard and they basically, the moisture in the vine itself, so it, the moisture is sitting in here, so the rabbit will girdle the vineyard. That's how tall a rabbit is, I guess. You can just run around and girdle a vine and when you girdle the vine like that, basically you end up a dead vineyard and you end up with these massive hillsides with dead vines. This is not a very, uh, friendly situation and it's very hard to control rabbits. With the shortage of water, I'm sure that the photo on the left hand side here is not gonna is, is going to become more rare. This is flood irrigation which is still practiced in some some areas of the world. Uh, we still use some flood irrigation today even but gradually it's getting replaced. And the different soils that we work with uh, is more extreme as well. So the more to the north and the more to the south we go um, we're working with different soils. This uh, vineyard here is uh, in Canada, but it could be very similar to what we talk about in the Barossa. Um, same situation where this is 100% sand, so not a lot of water holding capacity, very low organic matter, which is pretty much the way Barossa has been farmed. You know, they've been disking and disking and disking, and the topsoil has basically been blown away, and uh, we've got very sandy soils in the Barossa now. This is an interesting vineyard because obviously there was an irrigation break up here and so the water came down and I was trying to explain to these, this, uh, these vineyard managers about compaction. You can see the compaction because this is the tractor tire. It's been up and down this row and up and down and up and down and it's compacted the soil and so the roots of these vines are having a real hard problem to get through the soil. 
and it became aware, they became totally obvious <coughs> because the water from this break cannot get through the clay soil. So you see that is no water penetration at all in this vineyard. This is a photo of Catherine Cabernet. So you can see that this is an irrigated Cabernet and this is a dry farm Cabernet. This is the forefathers Cabernet. So dry farm there and uh, the skin to pulp ratio is much higher. <coughs> I apologize for my dry throat. And uh, so these wines make really intense wines, but these ones make much more soft velvety wines. And so a different style of wine, irrigated, unirrigated. And this is the photo I was alluding to earlier. This is Argentina and this is um, uh, Marlborough. Excuse me for a second. I'm just going to have to get a glass of water. The, they totally rely on uh, snowmelt from Argentina and this is Marlborough and literally there was only about, there was in, within a month, it was about two weeks apart. So you can see how dry Mendoza is becoming and even in Marlborough it's um, less green as well. So it looks green compared to Mendoza but trust me this still looks dry and so we are seeing the devastating effect of lack of water. Who would have thought that New Zealand would, would suffer from lack of rainfall, but it is. And then of course, the big one that you're probably more in, all, all interested in is the fires. And these are the fires that I've witnessed. I could have thrown in here 2008, uh, when we had the fires in Knights Valley as well. 16 and 18, these were the fires in Lake County. Absolutely devastating, but didn't get a lot of publicity. And then of course, 17 and 19, which were the fires that we talked about earlier on. 17 was the Tubbs fire and 19 was the Kincaid fire. And then in Australia, we've had a lot of fires and we can actually throw in here uh, 2000, uh, uh, sorry, 2020 as well, because we had the big fires there as well. And then in Okanagan, we've had a lot of fire as well. Carquinas is in Chile. But um, the three most important things for me about fire is the timing of the fire. Uh, if we get smoke, doing veraison when the berries are changing color the leaves are highly photosynthetic and uh, <clears throat> we can the vines will absorb anything that's around because they're they're very active and that's why you don't want to vote, grow vineyards near a garlic field an onion field or eucalyptus because they get the um they'll absorb the oils or the smoke the uh second thing is the analysis which i'll talk about here in a second because i think um we can we can we 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 think we know what we're measuring now, but how we can change that with winemaking processing is an interesting attribute, and that ties in with the third point, which is the treatment. And unfortunately, I have an opinion on all of this because of I've witnessed um, so much uh, fire damage in recent times. Now, this photo on the left is really interesting. I'd never heard of this before. So, speaking of rabbits, these rabbits were coming from this forested area, and the rabbits were on fire. They were burning and they were running through the vineyard. And as they ran through the vineyard, the grass was catching fire. And the vines weren't burning, of course, because grapevines don't burn because there's a lot of moisture in a grapevine. It's very hard to burn a grapevine. But what it was doing is as the grass burnt, it was affecting the buds. And the buds, therefore, were toasted and we lost uh, a year of production. This photo over here is in Calcinus and this fire is actually active and my point here is that when you have a fire at this point these leaves are in the desiccation stage so they're 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 not photosynthetic so they're not going to absorb the smoke but i will say that and we saw this in the tubs fire that <clears throat> and i've thought about this for a long time that when you get ash ash landing on the cluster is an issue and if that cluster comes into the winery and has uh has the ash sitting on it? Yes, you can get smoke taint that way. But generally, you know, from the, the fire that we got from Kincaid, it was, it was just really windy. We didn't have any ash. And so the, the smoke effect on the wine was actually not that bad. It was just um, 
uh, it's a timing issue. And as I said, if we get the uh, the um, timing wrong, then we will uh, we will have smoke damage if we get the smoke during um, Verizon. This is a photo taken in the Okanagan at midday uh, during Verizon. So this is not a good situation. So this is in 2015 and these, these uh, the vineyards in Okanagan in 15 were totally affected. This is, uh, you can see here, this is part of the Tubbs fire in 2000. This is in, uh, in Alexander Valley as the fire came down. You can see that these vines are pretty much finished and the harvest is, these vines had actually already been harvested, but they weren't going to be affected anyway by the smoke. So <coughs> to, um, to put a little light on some of these issues, and I don't really want to bore you too much, but and then again, these are anecdotal. As I said, timing is really important, and uh, but the analysis that we're, we're, we're measuring is also important. So what we're talking about is the same sort of analysis that we talk about with Britannomyces, for the guaiacol and for the phenol. The guaiacol numbers have to be under about 10 mic uh, micrograms and the, and the ethyl guaiacol have to be under about 16 micrograms is what I'm thinking. But with Pinot Noir, it needs to be lower. Cabernet got a little bit more elasticity because Cabernet is a little bit fuller and richer can, and can handle a little bit. But basically you have two forms of this guaiacol and phenol. You got the bound form and the free form. And using reverse osmosis, we can remove the free. And that's the stuff that you smell. And smoke is not smoky. When you get a wine that has smoke taint, it actually tastes like menthol. Remember when you were a kid, you smoked menthol cigarettes because that was cool, man. It's, that's the same character. That's what I get in wine. And that's the way I describe smoke taint. And I can see it in the berries too. If I eat a berry, it's got smoke taint. I, about three, four minutes later, you go, hmm, what was that? And you get that menthol character. So anyway, we've got the free form and the bound form. Using reverse osmosis, we can get rid of the free. Well, what happens is some of the bound then becomes free. You remove it again, again. So you've got to keep removing the free form. And so you keep running the wine through the reverse osmosis machine and you can run it three, four, five times. It's pretty typical. I've even seen wines run eight to 10 times and they've still scored pretty well. So it's not something that we can't control, but it's certainly not something that we desire to, to, uh, to have the issue with every year. Anyway, I want to thank you. Uh, we'll get back to the islands, uh, into Tahiti. Uh, the boys are still out there playing the ukuleles and uh, they, they're not too worried about their uh, island sinking at the moment. But um, anyway, we've got a long way to go. So I want to thank you for your attention this morning. And, uh, and uh, hey, remember, it's International Chardonnay Day today. So maybe I should have given a talk about Chardonnay. But please send me any photos of yourself drinking a glass of Chardonnay and I'll and I'll post uh, some cool ones if I get any on my Instagram site over the weekend or Facebook site. So yeah, any questions? Yeah, okay, so a question about uh, tipping. Yes, uh, so what happens is uh, when the, the vine is growing and what we get is if we, when we tip, so a vineyard is typically tipped two to three or even four times, no, usually two times in where we are in California. So when you tip it, when you tip that cane, two more shoots grow, okay? And uh, that removes a lot of the vigor that would be formed in the fruit zone with leafing and all of that sort of stuff. So we get these two shoots. Now the next decision is usually later in the season. And this is a really important decision when you wanna do the second tipping because you've got two choices. If you tip here, you get two and two. So what you're doing is you're forcing the growth of the vine into the upper reaches of the, of the canopy. If you, if you cut here and you go back to one cane, then you're going to force more leaves into the fruit zone. Those leaves will create shading. They also create more photosynthesis because they're younger leaves and they're more active. So, yeah, good question. So I appreciate that. Yes, and, and um, yeah, a very important question about those clusters in, in terms of tons per acre and the reason why it's not that important anymore is purely because we've got more vines 
per hectare, more vines per acre. Sorry, I always get, <laughs> I forget who I'm talking to, who my audience is. We've got more vines per acre. So we really got to look at how many pounds per vine that we're looking at. And, so, and that really depends on the variety. So a variety like Chardonnay is going to be a lot heavier than a Pinot Noir or a Cabernet cluster. So, you know, I've seen, and, and Petite Syrah can be uh, very small as well. Petite Bedeau can be very heavy. So you can talk about clusters of being about 1.2 uh, pounds uh, right up to, um, to uh, uh, 0.8 pounds, something like that. So, we, but we've got to look at um, complete uh, pounds per vine rather than, uh, than tons per acre. Cool. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate uh, everybody watching today and they'll, um, I'll take this and post it on YouTube and you'll be able to see it there. So uh, thanks again. Same time next Friday, 9am Pacific for another webinar. Take care.